Hello, everyone. I'm Julian from the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis Discord server. I'm here with Manuel Post and Mark Lefebvre. Again, we're going to do a redux of the discussion that we started a couple of months ago, being the relationship of religion that is not a religion, John Vivaki's famous idea, with human nature. And last time we had a I think a very fruitful discussion in which we uh, explored John's idea in a steel manning way and uh, made sure that we under understood his idea properly. I think we did. And then did a little historical run through of the concept of human nature. And then that proceeded into a very good discussion about uh, what would it look like if religion that is not a religion took that question into consideration. So this time, um, Manuel Post has taken the driver's seat and he's got a presentation that we will be doing Dialogos over. So we're hoping that something new emerges as we look for the virtues in this question, I suppose. How does religion that is not a religion relate to human nature? Uh, of course, we've got Mark Lefebvre here as well. Hi, Mark. Hello. Good to see you again, of course. And Great uh, to be here. Thanks again for your time. Manuel, did you want to take it from here? Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I, I rephrased the thing where we left off a little bit different, right? Like we were like, well, what is the purpose of written art, right? Like that's what, what our exploration was around. And then and what you said, the problems of, of being human and, and how Riddler relates to those problems. And then in the first bit, we, we kind of went over like a little bit what the problems are with institutionalized religion, right? Like where, where the, the dogma and, 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 and how, how that relates to the mythos. And so, so what I wanted to do today is approach it from a little bit different angle we're like what what Rittner can provide to people in in order to to deal with with the fundamental problems so in, instead of describing it high level like oh these are the problems of, of what it means to be human is like like what what can we provide to people uh, that that allows them to to make a life for themselves in community within a structure right because that that's what Rittner is that 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 is the structure and then uh there's there's a couple reasons where i i want to go this direction because I, I think uh having having the basis allows for for some emergence right instead of of all the issues that that are problematic with the, the top-down element when, when you're uh kind of imposing things and and then also it's 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 dealing with things that we can actually do right like practices are, are, are things that we can provide to people uh they are already uh, available but we're also intending to to make some more uh and and if if we get a good idea of of, of well what is the purpose of all of these practices and and uh and, and how, how can we provide these practices in, in a good way to people then like if, if you want to put that in the format of written art or you want to put, put some other jacket on it that that's all fine with me. So is there some comments that you'd like to make? I think I, I just want to follow up with, uh, you know, at the very end of our talk, uh, I sort of talked about some of the utility in terms of ethics, morals, and the utility of religion within that framework, right? So there was a proposition of sorts in there about the difference between ethics and morality, how to define them, and how that interrelates with religion per se, right? That, that was the talk around, if I see a cross on your neck, maybe I have an idea of what your ethical standards or what your ethical considerations are, which virtues you hold highest. And if you fail to meet them, maybe that's a moral error, but it may not be a result of unethical behavior, 
right? And therefore I can continue to trade with you, even though you make a mistake in that sort of higher realm, if you will, in that higher dimension of action. And so I just wanted to point that out. That was like, that was where also where we left off. Uh, and, and so that should somewhat inform us going forward. And maybe we don't need to talk about it any further, right? That there's a whole two hour video uh, with, with that with that component at the end. But we do need to keep in mind the utility of what we're doing at the same time. And I would say that goes to what Rittenar is supposed to do, right? And under the larger umbrella of what religion is supposed to afford us. Jules? Yeah, um, some comments? I'm, ha I'm happy to go with the flow of your presentation. Uh, I could see potentially fitting Mark's uh, proposition in on your third point. So if you've given us a, sort of a framework here, Manuel, what's the functional purpose of written R? <clears throat> um, what's the problems of being human and what's the problems with institutionalized religion? It sounds like that confluence between being human and being in a religion does encapsulate what you're talking about, Mark. Uh, the ethical and moral dimension of being human as it um, relates to what we consider to be religion, especially institutionalized religion, maybe. Um, I'd only maybe just to support uh, your point there, Mark, it did stand out to me as well last time what you said, um, how, how you kind of retrofit ethics or morals into your perception of other people as religious uh, and also how does religion retrofit a framework onto people regarding ethics and morality but I don't as you say that's a whole thing so I, I, I think it would fit into Manuel's thing on the institutional side does that sound fair Manuel? Yeah, well, we, we can we can get into that, right? So, so uh, the problem formulation, the I, I scheduled it in, into four categories where you you have the individual. The individual has has to maintain alignment in life, right? So, the individual needs practices, and those practices need to be contained in a local structure. So there needs to be something analogous to, to a church where, where people can go, they can meet, they can do the practices together, they can have the Sangha type experience, uh, they, they can support each other. Um, new people can go there as well, right? Uh, so, so that's important. And, th and then th there's the global structure. So like if, if you, if you want to, and this goes to Mark's ethics thing, right? Like if, if you want to have something like a religion, it, it needs to cohere in some sense, right? Like it needs to be the same thing because if, if it doesn't have that identity, then it's it's not the same thing. So that means that there, there needs to be uh, a, a top-down element and uh, intercommunication between realms. And like, I'm again, going to the Christian example of, 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 of the church with, with the Vatican, like, something similar need, needs to be there else it, well we, we'll, we'll get the the protestant version and we all know how that goes and if you don't it's a mess <laughs> so so those are are separate dimensions because because the local structure doesn't necessarily inform uh the the global structure like but but the they need they need they need to have an interface and, and 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 a way of relating and then there's there's this thing i'm gonna make the analogy with the questions again right like holidays uh way, ways of of being together where you relate to certain aspects of, of what it is to be alive uh pay remembrance and uh and have have a way to to socially cohere and connect outside of of your local structure and you, you can imagine that being in in the form of, of uh well like festivals but you can also have have it as as lectures or whatever right or 
or you can go to a retreat with a group of people like that there's many ways that that you can can conceive of that so so that's that's basically uh fairly unrelated aspects of 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 uh of religion to me so uh, what do you guys think about that yeah i guess um this is this is interesting so um you know in our in our tradition that we're starting here i have not seen the slide deck actually i mean briefly but not you know not in advance so this is this is wonderful for uh, getting, you know, getting out this for the first time and seeing in real time how we work this out, right, amongst ourselves. And, you know, to 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 Julian's point, right, this is, this is, we're trying to engender dialogos. We're hoping that this is the type of dialectic that leads to dialogos. And I think the surprise element for me, at least, is, is helpful, right? And when you talk about practices, my brain first goes to, there's practices you do privately and practices you do publicly. Right. And then if you want to extend that practices, you can have practices in the local structure where larger groups get together. So the thing about the Sangha, at least the one that that uh, we, we we've ginned up here on the Discord server or moved over from John's original uh, meditation series on on YouTube over to the Discord. Um, those structures seem to work well. Uh, smaller than say a local structure like a church would require, right? And we do it online. Uh, I wouldn't call what we do an online church, for example. Uh, Paul van der Klee might disagree, <laughs> right? Just because there are similarities, but I think there are important differences in the size. And so when you're talking about practices and private practices, there are private practices that are private to you personally, and there are private practices that are private below the local structure that are important because they're smaller Maybe they're, you know, like, like uh, Bible studies or maybe have this quality. I don't know. I've never been to one, so I make no claims, right? I'm just spitballing here on, on what that might look like. For us, it's the, obviously the meditation sangha, the after meditation talk. Um, and then the local structure idea is interesting, right? So we get together on the larger sort of issues and sort of are able to discuss things with larger groups, which enables us, right? So a lot of this practices and local structure and global structure and the events I'll argue are all methods of engendering distributed cognition. So I think it's helpful to think of it that way. And then I'm gonna argue, uh, and I've actually uh, pinged John about this argument. I'm, I'm a little disturbed by the idea of distributed cognition per se, because, and, and maybe this is a me thing, right? Cause I'm trapped in my own little bubble. Distributed is always good, but I think that there's that when people point to the bad aspects of distributed cognition of religion, they think they ah, dogma or ah oh, the religion says this, right? That's distributed cognition too, right? And so it can go horribly wrong. Like distributed cognition doesn't mean it's going to go horribly right. It can also go horribly wrong. It's just a tool, you go in either direction. But these different types of distributed cognition, where you have private practices by yourself, which hopefully you're engendering, say in meditation, where you're in dialogue with different parts of yourself, right? Maybe that's part of the point of a good meditative practice. Um, and maybe dialogue isn't the right term, but you're at least in contact or in relationship to, or in understanding with different aspects of yourself. And that, that helps you. But then in the Sangha, and we see this in our Sangha in particular, and other people reliably report this in their Sanghas, uh, in the larger group, when you're discussing your private practice, uh, that you're sitting with other people, hopefully, but but maybe also just your private practice. That's when a different form of distributed cognition comes along, right? And this is that thing I, I talk about this often in the saying. I think a few people, like a week or two ago, started to click, right? I know two things about our meditation, our after meditation chat. One, we don't really make any sense. Two, everybody knows what everybody else is talking about. I, I'm not prepared to explain how that's possible, but I'm going to state that that's what's going on that those two things are happening. And I don't think they're contradictory. I think this gets to the point of more what the mystics were on about uh, and gets us out of the scientific propositional procedural thinking and more into this realm where we have a common commonality between us. And that's why the local structure is important because you wanna take that distribution of cognition in your local Sangha and bring it up to large groups of people. And then 
bash those ideas around a bit, right? More distributed cognition, more talking about the same subject, but with larger groups. And then maybe, maybe sang, sang it spontaneously uh, uh, form different types of leadership or different leaders within them. Maybe a limited number, because I, I don't think leadership is possible for everybody or even the majority of people will say, but certainly there are thought leaders or idea leaders that emerge within groups uh, spontaneously and they're able to get together, right? And then everybody else is also able to inform them at the local structure level. And the global structure level, it's the same sort of thing. I think that it's important to have a global structure because that can inform all the local structures as to what's going on. And so this is a bit like trees in the forest. When one tree gets bitten by a certain type of bug or attacked by a certain type of fungus, it will signal the rest of the forest. Now, maybe that tree won't even survive, but maybe the other trees will. And so that's why it's important to have these structures at different layers, talking to each other, right? And going back and forth. Maybe that local structure needs more help, right? And then, and then that can be provided by the other structures. I don't know, but without a global communications network, you don't have that option at all. And there's also the, you know, there's still, again, this doesn't necessarily solve a problem because it's still the problem that can be misused or it can go wrong, right? Or it can corrupt. Uh, and, you know, that happens. That happens in the, in the uh, church structures now. Uh, but I think we're blaming the tools for the things that aren't the tools fault. And you can't get around some of these tools that will say the religions and the churches have used up until this point. And then I like this idea of events and I'd like to just reframe it quickly before I end. Events, it occurs to me in the moment, this is a wonderful way to learn. <laughs> events are times when you have a bunch of people pointed at the same aim, whatever that aim is. Maybe it's remembering our veterans, right? Maybe it's uh, engendering the, the, the spirit of giving, right? Through something like Christmas, right? Maybe it's uh, coming in contact with erotic love, right? That would be Valentine's Day, right? And maybe, maybe there's different ways to do this. And, you know, you could make arguments for like, maybe the Jews have this way better than everybody else, right? Maybe uh, enforce suffering or engendering suffering on a regular basis uh, provides you a better amount of contrast and that helps you to see the world more clearly that sounds like a reasonable thesis to me. It's something I've been on about my whole life. I really like the, some of the Jewish traditions where they're basically, yeah, no electricity and stuff. It's like, oh, it's awesome. And I've, I've used that myself, although not with any sort of rigor for sure. Um, and, and so I think events are really important uh, because you do have this sense that there's maybe other people may be pointed in roughly the same direction. And again, that provides contrast. If you're all looking at the same thing, but from different places, because we live in a relativistic world to one another, right? And this is my objective reality doesn't solve anything problem because relativity exists, right? Everything is relative to your location and you can't be in an objective location, right? And even if you could, everybody can't be there at once. So it's good to simulate that by all pointing in the same direction and then seeing where you're at because it gives you those aspects of orientation and direction that you can't get any other way. And so I think that's to me is what makes events important and the, the dual aspect of practices and all four of those things seem to cohere very nicely. Well done, Manuel. I really like that, that scaffolding you've provided for us. Uh, what do you think, Jul Julian? How, how do you feel about this? Um, Thanks for asking. Let me just shift over here. The lighting is oy, a little bit bad. How's that? Better? Sorry, it is just the start of the day here, guys. So my uh, lighting setup is the window. <laughs> How's that? All right. So I don't want to uh, interrupt the flow of where you're going with this, Manuel. So I'm just going to give you my first impressions of um, what came to my mind. Uh, notwithstanding what you were saying too, Mark, which I'm processing right now. You know, the first thing that jumped out of my mind, Manuel, when you laid out the problem like this was something, because I am a Christian, because I've been through the church experience such as it is, in different modes, I can talk to what it's like from the inside of a religion, an institutionalized religion, and also how 
structure is a problem, but it's not a problem to do with religion. I think it's a problem to do with us as people. So the thing that jumped out at me is in the, in the, in the letters that the early Christian apostles were writing to their churches, one of the apostles, I can't remember who, might have been Peter, might have been Paul, said that this church is not built by human hands. And that always struck me. I always thought, well, that's quite interesting. Okay. I like that idea because growing up in the, um, in the, uh, the eighties and the nineties, uh, and then into the two thousands, I think as Mark was outlining the respect for church as a structure declined and declined exponentially. Uh, that was, uh, fed into by, well, frankly, I think the light that came from media stories. Those are actually good things if you shine a light into these kind of shady structures and expose horrible things that are happening. You know, in my mind, it's like, yeah, that should be destroyed, to be honest. But those levels of problems aren't exclusive to religions. And I think... Um, John Vivek, he might have talked about this too, that there, there are problems to do with us being humans and how we do things like structure. So the only comment I'd like to make is I wonder what religion that is not a religion could do along the idea of this church is not built by human hands. And I'll leave it at that. Can you, can you give us some idea of what you think that means? Well, I think explicitly it means that human agendas need to be explicitly put to one side. And in the Christian context, that means uh, allowing yourself to be open to the divine agenda. And I think that's a wonderful recipe, but that has problems of its own. Your God says this, my God says that. Ah. <laughs> okay. So what it means is um, in the Christian context that we follow a set of practices, going to your first point, which are the set of practices which are how do you overcome your human nature by allowing yourself to connect with the divine nature through, I think Jonathan Pajot is coming to the Sanger next week, right? He would call it, theosis right that process where you allow yourself through the connection with the divine to become more divine <clears throat> and whatever comes out of that practice informs the structuring of uh, what you do together so what would that look like in written art I, I would probably say everyone gets an insight going to mark's point and it's messy but, you know, the insight is bread for that day and you go from there. Does that make any sense, Emmanuel? Yeah, so that, that brings up the wisdom of Hypatia. They had this structure in Neoplatonism where you have the purification and then you have the theology and then you have the theurgy, right? So the purification is, is gaining distance from where you're at like getting perspective, getting relationship. And then the theology is, is relating to the structure provided by, well, the religion, or in, the, in that case, Neoplatonism, and, and gaining an understanding of, of what your place is in the universe. And then the, the theurgy is, is where you get a participatory relationship with through that understanding right so you have this map that you can follow and you can engage with that map and then you can start exploring inside yourself and because you have the structure you you have a way of navigating the combinatorially explosive way ways of of being in the world um so, so and then well i think john brings an aspiration here where aspiration is is kind of like the map but 
but it's not imposed it's self-generated but it's well like what are you generating it from right and i think that's what he calls the cultural cognitive grammar in in some sense um so so yeah that that, that would be a process um i'm struggling to see how that would work on a group level to be fair like uh, on an individual level, I I I, I highly li like that that model, and it seems to be correct too. Yeah, and maybe maybe it doesn't work on the group level, like because <laughs> people are in different places. They start in different places, they move at different speeds, and they're not necessarily going to the same proximal goal, even if they're going to the same ultimate goal, because everybody's in a different place, right? A different space. They're coming from a different starting point, so and they're moving along and maybe they're not even moving the right direction. And the idea of orientation, unlike direction, is that maybe like if you're doing orienteering with a compass, you don't go straight to where you're at. The purpose of orienteering is to figure out how to get around obstacles. And so you may be headed that way, but you may need to go this way first, or you may need to go this way backwards and then, for, and then over and then forwards, right? To get to the thing that you're aiming at ultimately. And that's why I like the idea of orientation separate from the idea of direction. Direction is proximal when you're moving, right? It's not necessarily proximal when you're orienting, but then the orientation, it, it you know, tells you which proximal direction to get to the ultimate direction that you were originally uh, trying to get to. And the fact that we're all moving around the, the, the space, the ethical landscape, we'll call it differently, is the thing that uh, means that we can't globally uh, or, or even locally in, in this model engender uh, theurgy, right? It's just, it's a very personal journey and we need to be with each other on that personal journey rather than trying to force, and it's a very human thing to want to do, force the control, you're going to be on this journey, you're going to go in this direction, right? And, and let people go in their, in their own direction. And, you know, it strikes me as, was watching a show uh, last night on Confucianism, and that's very much the way they solve the problem, right? Confucius basically says, nope, be a good person. And here's a bunch of rituals to make sure you're going to be a good person. And they're very big on rote learning in China. And so in some ways, the, their education is from our perspective backwards. They're doing more education like we did in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, especially at the lower grades, right? We tend to equivocate on education. And that idea of ritualistic and rote learning is very important to the Chinese. And the aim is ridiculous. It's virtuous, right? It's be a virtuous person, right? Respect for your elders by default, right? But not defer to your elders, respect for your elders. Those are different things, very interesting, Right. And then that's what builds the society and the culture in the right direction, because you're all pointed in this sort of higher direction on this plane, this ethical plane of, of virtuousness or different types of virtues that you're trying to engender. And that is independent of the other structures. So it, it's interesting that, that the East has that concept and it, it's not all that different necessarily from, from the Greek tradition or from the, or from the Western churches in some ways. So uh, are we okay? And uh, we can hop over to the next slide. So I was uh, trying to describe a, a couple of fundamental problems that, that people have to engage with. Uh, so this is kind of relating to, to what it means to be a human. Uh, it's by no means an exhaustive list, but it, it gives an impression of of how to look at it, right? And I'm, I'm not even trying to argue that these frames are correct, although they're pretty fundamental, but who knows, right? <laughs> so so you, you relate to things in the world. You relate to yourself and you relate to things that are outside of you. Uh, and the most important part of that is, is humans. And, and you require a, What's the good word for that? A structure, but well, maybe a theology is, is the correct word here from which you relate to yourself and other people, 
right? Like you need you need the narrative that that you you aspire to see in the world that you can use to to color that that interaction. Um, so so that that would be a thing that that would be needed to be provided by by Ridner. And then another thing is well like. Like how, how do we relate? Like how do we have relationship? Well, we do that by attending to things, right? And then we can attend to the specific, the suchness, and we can attend to to the potential, right? Like the, the things that could be, and that's the mourners. And those two are different aspects, and those have their benefits and they have their negative sides. So getting an understanding of the benefits and the negatives and getting an understanding of how to inhabit those modes and getting an understanding of what it means to switch between them is also uh, vital for, for, I guess, being quick enough to relate to the changing world. There, I like that. <laughs> and then an another dimension is is uh, well, we have problems in the here and now, and then we, we have a preparation that we need to do to the future. But we also have, apart from the preparation, we have a navigation problem with the future, and then that relates back to the here and now, um, and to to weigh that and like like when should I pay attention here and when should I pay attention there uh, um, and 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 do do I value what I have right now or should I sacrifice for the future and and like that that is a highly complex space and like I don't even know if we want to get get structures to do that but like the thing that I, I foresee doing that would be a social structure, right? Where you can engage with people who can give you the right feedback at, at the moment that you need it. So, so, so that you can be informed by them instead of having the, to figure out these things on your own. So, so that's, that's like, um, well, like a, a layout of, of, of the things that written art should provide to people and like, uh, Maybe we can come up with some more of them, although I don't know how valuable of, of use of our time that would be. But yeah, like I want to engage with, well, is this the level of analysis that we should understand these problems or, or is that the wrong way to approach it? Yeah, I like what you've done here, Manuel. This is great, right? This is fantastic. I'll, I'll nitpick uh, relationships, should be relationship, I think, uh, just to nitpick, my bad, uh, but I love to nitpick, so. Um, and I like how you have axes, and then you have these contrasts, right? Self, others, right? And then there's the axes, and that is a line of travel along which you can't escape. You have to go more towards self or more towards others. You don't really have a choice, right? You can't, can't split the baby on that. You have to be somewhere along that axis. And that contrast, right? And then we get back into middle path stuff. You can't stay in the middle path because you won't encounter the contrast. But I like this idea of these axes and running along these three. And yeah, we could probably go for six or eight or something, but just introducing the idea as a, a method of introducing the problem definition, I think is more than sufficient. And I really like these. I think, I think these are great. Um, and then you can think of the axes as the place where the opponent processing that, that John talks about exists, right? So John Verveke talks about opponent processing. Here is axes of opponent processing. And I think that this is a great starter list. If nothing else, it's a great starter list. Again, you've got an axis of attention, right? Attending to your point, you have to attend to relationships. And there's this suchness versus moreness, right? You can't can't have both like you have to make a decision and i think the big problem that we run into is you go oh you made the wrong decision about where to be it, it's like well maybe but it's a dynamic shifting system and there is ne not necessarily a right answer because it could be all the way one way 
and still do the right thing or all the other way and still do the right thing. There's so many dependencies and we're so intellectually lazy from our need to conserve energy that we don't want to hear these complicated answers. There's more than one axis I have to consider. No, no, I want a binary answer. I want a quick two minute, do I do it or not? And that's not the way the world works. And I, I like, you know, I mean, maybe there's too much of a, of a, uh, of a tie-in between relationship and attention, um, but certainly planning cuts across them, right? It's certainly completely orthogonal. There's still always the now versus future and, you know, the opponent processing. And then another way to think of opponent processing is something I talk about on, on my YouTube channel, uh, Navigating Patterns, right? Where I go into this idea of trade-offs. So I have a video on free choice I talk about trade-offs. I'll be talking more about trade-offs. Trade-offs are important. That's what we're talking about with A, opponent processing, and B, the idea of access, axes rather, and C, the idea of contrast. And you can't make good decisions in low contrast conditions. I think that one of the flaws of Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, whom I dearly love for some reason, despite him being Canadian and a philosopher and having taught at Harvard, that's like three strikes in my book, he talks about resolution, and sometimes that's a mischaracterization. What he should be talking about is contrast, because contrast and resolution are related, but they're definitely not the same thing. And I've caught him a couple times, you know, on this third round where we're rewatching uh, on the uh, on the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis Discord, we're rewatching the uh, Maps of Meaning series, and I've caught him a couple times confusing the two or at least from my perspective, confusing the two. And I'm going, ah, oh, there's, there's a better way to think about this. There's a better way to deal with this. And I'm glad that we have the opportunity now with John's framework to talk more about these things and, and figure out, ah, I knew there was you know, something not quite right and here it is. Um, but yeah, I like this at least as a starter. I don't think we need to go into more detail, right? We're not trying to solve the written art puzzle or anything, but we are trying to give people something to think about when they're thinking about these difficult issues. Even at a high level, there's some obvious uh, areas of tension and uh, places, opportunities for opponent processing and having that understanding of contrast and its importance in allowing us to make sense of things, uh, both as individuals and in groups. I think that's super important. So yeah, I really, I really like this slide. This is, this is fantastic. I don't know, Julian, what do you think? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Please call me Jules. Sorry, man. I, I was a little bit uh, formal when I started because I was in another place this morning. Please call me Jules. My friends call me Jules. Um, right. So uh, I think what Mark's doing is what I'd like to do as well, Manuel. And um going back to the technique of Dialogos, um, uh, which is to try and amplify your point, um, really for the sake of clarity. And so what I'm seeing with this model that you're presenting to us, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I want to clarify, is this the part where you're talking about what are the problems of being human? Yeah, like, there, there's a, well, that's their navigation problems, right? So if, if we look at human beings as things that need to relate to the world, uh, that is navigation problems. Like there, there's other problems maybe, right? Like which are more existential in nature. Uh, but I, I want to do this pragmatic part first because I think it's most important. So perennial might be one way to think of it. Maybe these are the perennial axes or, or yeah, axes which act, I don't want to say they're properties, but they act as properties on all other problems. I think that might be a fair characterization, Manuel. What do you think? Is that is that a fair way to think about it? Well, yeah, or, or, or maybe not all, but enough to be valuable, right? Like I, I don't want to make complete claims. My bad. Yeah, well, I, I'm not going to get in your way. I, I want to see where you uh, go with this. Okay, well, uh, let me go to the next one. So then, uh, yeah, so so we've, well, the, the practices are supposed to get together in an ecology. So uh, I, I wanted to 
put them into two groups where we have a, a group of practices that are used by the individual in an individual setting. And then we have communal practices. And um, yeah, let's start with the communal ones because they map back to, to what we said, right? So, so you have a local structure that's analogous to the church that has a set of practices like, well, which are probably mostly related to keeping the community at, at the right aim. Um, so, so yeah, that, that would be organizational mostly. Um, and then we, we have a, a thing like outreach, like if, if we wanna act like a religion, well, we wanna do good in the world, right? So we, we need to do things like volunteering, gathering new people in, uh, st stuff like that. So, so that would be a, a set of practices. Well, you could call it a practice, you can also call it something else. But I, I like to call it a practice because uh, I, I think people should present themselves in a specific way that there needs to be all, all sorts of containers in, in, in relationship. Um, we need to express the virtues when in contact with other people, right? Like, so, so maybe that's like the place where you get to practice your implementation. That would be nice. And then, and then, well, like if you have a global structure for the thing, then there needs to be interfacing within within the global thing, and well, you could do that online or, or or in person. But but yeah, that would be a set of practices or, or structures in which that gets expressed. So that, that's the communal side. And then we have the individual practices and like I, I split them up in, in uh, three categories, right? Like sort the of physical one, we have a relationship with our body. We need to maintain our body. Uh, this can go as far as nutrition or whatever you want. And, and then we have the mental ones, which is um, the thing that the previous slide was going on about, right? Like, how do we relate to the world? Uh, what, what do we pay attention to? Uh, and, and then we have the social one where like, how do we inform our relationships? Uh, how do I express myself in a social situation? Uh, th well, there, there's, there's a different level of complexity when, you, when you're engaged in, in, in a social uh, situation compared to something that, that is you and objects or you and yourself. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's kind of the, the setup for thinking about the ecology of practices um, and where, where they need to relate to. So uh, I'd like to invite you guys to give some comments on this. Wow, this is, this is another great slide, Manuel. I was, uh, I was right. So I'm going to resort to nitpicking because when it's my time for slides, I don't think I'm going to meet either <laughs> of your two uh, presentations with the uh, with the same level of awesomeness here. This is this is really good. Uh, it's funny. The first time I read this, I read, you know, I was I was basically reading left to right along each of the issues, right? I was like, oh, and I could see a relationship there too. Um, I think that for the nitpicky part, when John talks about ecology of practices. He's talking about a personal ecology that you develop, right? That, 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 you, that, that you're engendering, at least. Maybe you don't develop it, or maybe, maybe you have to. I don't know. I'm not ambivalent on that. I haven't thought about it. Um, and what you've done here is laid out sort of the, the, the eight large buckets that every ecology has to have something to address right, I think. And along these two axes, you know, the communal and the individual. And I, yeah, I, I, I hadn't thought of it that way. I know we did a lot of work on schematization um, of the practices. And, and I like this list. This is a pretty complete, complete list. Um, I, I, I think that thinking of it this way really helps you to 
uh, break things out in a way that's going to allow a better schematization of those practices within within the structure of written R, whatever that turns out to be. Um, and this sort of gives you something pragmatically, I think, to start to hang on to and, and start to move towards and interface with uh, in terms of building up what's needed to go forward in a religion that's not a religion, right? So you don't, you don't need the larger structures that we were talking about, even the local structure, to start thinking about your personal ecology and what that means. And maybe the local structure and the global structures are the things that are coming up with templates, suggestions, guidelines, for how to develop the ecology. I mean, someone has to schematize it. Those schemas have to be agreed upon. Uh, that has to be a global thing, roughly speaking. Um, and then, yeah, we get back to the Protestantism, right? If we have splits on which, you know, which system is most efficacious or something, then we could run into the Protestant problem and things could just splinter on us again, uh, which has, to your earlier point, right? I call it the Protestant catastrophe for a reason. Uh, and uh, you know that that could that could be a problem, but I I, I like this overall layout, uh, and the more I think about it, I think the more I the more I like this this approach over we'll say our earlier approach, Manuel, when we went to uh, to do this schematization. I think this might be an easier way to slice it and dice it, at least at a higher level. I think the stuff we had probably worked, or at least was close enough to something that could work, uh, but we weren't approaching it here with this and uh yeah jules i just i just wanted to uh pass over to you but first say uh thank you uh for for uh, uh correcting me and allowing me to call you jules because i do consider you a good friend so i really appreciate that uh go ahead tell us what you think that's heartwarming thanks mark let me amplify what mark said manuel um bringing it back to john's notion of ecology of practices so if we took your schema here and referenced john again uh, my understanding of why an ecology is because of the tendency of the psycho technologies to be even on their own not necessarily good so um too much mindfulness becomes navel gazing, uh, not enough mindfulness, uh, you know, you don't get an insight. So you need to employ some of the practice um, to offset the psychotechnology of mindfulness, which I think was uh, active open mindedness or something. There's always this kind of offsetting. So I think Mark's right to tighten the definition a little bit uh, in terms of does ecology of practices mean that self uh, checks and balance checks and balances style self correction of the stuff you do? Um, how does that fit into what you're looking at here? Is it uh, a checks and balances of how the individual is going with um, how the community is going? Is that what we're talking about? Oh, uh, it's interesting to talk about it in, in the language of checks and balances. I, I haven't uh, thought about it that way. Um, Sorry, that's my um, constitutional history starting to spill out. <laughs> Carry on. Well, yeah, well, that you're pointing at a problem there, right? Like th there needs to be direction and, and oversight and well, right. Be people need, need to be brought in to be subjected to that as well. Um, so yeah, so, so, so here we get into a priestly class type of uh, thing where, where where the outreach would be to visit people at home or whatever, right? Like, because they haven't shown up or uh, or they've been acting out and, and like someone needs to take responsibility. So like, I guess what I want to introduce here is this idea that we've been playing around with 
on the Discord and hopefully gets implemented soon. And and it's like, yeah, you have your fellow travelers, and then you, you have a set of people who who are responsible for for the guiding, but but they're not responsible for for informing. And then you you have you have a set of of, of teachers or, or or whatever, right? Like like who who are are there in some sense. And, and and that I have the ability to lift other people up. So so that that would be like three groups, and well, you can you can repeat that structure on any level you want. Um, so, so 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 that that would be a, a way of of having checks and balances, right? Where there, there's there's level, well, more social level of checks and balances, and then there's there's. A, is it an intellectual level? I guess it's an intellectual level of, of, of checks and balances that that are in in relation to each other, but not like highly uh, attached to to each other. Yeah, I like uh, I like what you brought up here, Jules. This is great. I um, didn't see that coming either. Uh, <laughs> it's getting left and right. Good slides and good points. I love it. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I guess that's immediately where my mind went to, Manuel, when, 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 uh, uh, when Jules said what he said was priestly class. Uh oh, it's all coming back in. So I'm, I'm not sure how far off of a church structure you're actually going to get with written art, much to probably everybody's disappointment. But I do, obviously, like we worked on this, the the guide versus the uh, sage or something, right? Like the the, the person who's sort of pretending or, or at least proximally on your same level working with you. And then the reason why I think that might work is something that we've been uh, hearing about and talking about recently, right? Uh, Paul Vanderklein in particular talks about you're looking outward, right? That's part of your sense making in terms of sanity, right? So we make sense, sanity. It's, it's all over our little corner of the internet, this idea that we, we use the distributed cognition, which by the way, again, is also outsourced cognition. Uh, and I think outsourcing has a bad enough name that maybe it'll make us take some care with the concept of distributed cognition. I'll, I could argue both ways. I could argue all distributed cognition is a form of outsourcing or at least partial outsourcing. Uh, and you can argue it the other way, but I think it's more uh, helpful to talk in terms of outsourced cognition because that is the problem of the church. When you outsource too much cognition to the priest and you don't get enough feedback from the people directly around you who maybe know you better because the priest only has limited time or the or the pastor, or, you know, whoever I'm using priest because I grew up around too many Catholics, although very little church attendance. Don't, don't know much. Didn't read that book. What's it called again? I forget. Anyway. Yeah. So you have that, you have that, that guy who's up here who really doesn't have the level of contact with you probably, right. That the people proximal to you have, and that's more the guide concept versus the sagely concept. And to your point, Manuel, you can just repeat that structure all the way up. And, you know, we get back to this idea of three things, right? And that I, I argue on my, on my YouTube channel, right? It's the three that's important because that's where you get direction and orientation. That's when you start to gain a level of perspective that's useful, that adds the level of dimensionality you need to start understanding the world, not only at the proper resolution, but with the proper level of contrast because it's really the contrast that helps the resolution in this case. And that's, that's where this comes into play back to your previous slide about local and global structures, where it's like, oh, okay, well, the local structure can provide so much guidance uh, at the structural level, right? Aside from your guide and your a local sage will say, maybe that's where the sage locally hangs out and there's one sage per local unit or something, I don't know. Uh, although I'd probably argue that there's different stages for different things or something. That's probably a more uh, uh, flexible structure, right? Uh, uh, right, Because the, the more you democratize and spread things out, the more you find these sort of anomalous people, right? And let them rise to the top at the thing they're best at instead of you know, requiring them to follow a certain path or a certain set of rules. It's the great, great sort of equalizer of capitalism, actually, right? So the, Ac free access to free and equal access to capital, right? And you can argue it's not free and equal, but the freer and equaler access to capital helps like all the people who would be good entrepreneurs to be good entrepreneurs or closer to that number than would otherwise. This is the same sort of concept where like, everyone's there. And because they don't all have to go to seminary to enact the sagely wisdom or whatever type of sagely wisdom they may have, they're high enough up in the structure to 
be something you can look up to for a certain class of thing, right? Or in a certain area, uh, because we all have levels of expertise, higher and lower. And, and it's good to let as many people exhibit those, those uh, qualities as possible, and then use the guidance, the local guidance, along with the more global guidance, uh, local guidance of say the people closest to you that spend the most time with you, along with the global guidance of the people who are say in that quote priestly class or, or whatever, uh, and, and have those two things interact in a way that gives you a way to adjust your ecology to meet your needs. Because sometimes some of these practices over time, and time is the thing that destroys all systems, uh, are going to need to change. And it's hard to know when. And maybe those two things together give us the opponent processing at the distributed cognition level or the outsourced cognition level to know when changes need to be made. And maybe to make better choices about those changes. Maybe not, but maybe. And I think that's, that's an important aspect here. Uh, I don't know, Jules, based on that, if you have additional comments before we move on, but uh, if you do, please. Thank you. I think I'd like to move on. Uh, can I flag that it, I feel like it would be smart to recover the notion of priesthood from Judaism and how that fed into Christianity for later, because I'd like to hear more of your know, the slides uh, anyway. Well, yeah, if you want to take some time, I think the next one is the last one. So, uh. okay, well, just very quickly uh, to make sure that I understood Mark's point, I think he was doing a corollary between in our culture that the priest class is really something like a venture capitalist or a bank uh, that is some sort of cluster of people and resources which empower uh, other people to become, you know, a good cluster of people and resources. Did I understand that right, Mark? Yeah, I, I sort of uh, I sort of recoiled, but but you're right. That's that sounds quite correct. And then up to and including, um, you know, and this does happen. Like people just ignore when things when good things happen that that sort of uh, go against their 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 beliefs or their points or or their their desperate desire to uh, to to make something into something that it's not. Uh, that happens, right? There are banks that loan people money, and those people then form banks. Right. And so in capitalism, uh, people you do implement what's called cooperation all the time. And people also implement accidental um, uh, competition. And also you can't prevent competition quite so easily uh, in capitalism. So I mean, it's much easier in, in like a socialist economic system, right? Because it's just bureaucratic by nature. So it's, it's going to be instantly more corrupt. Uh, so it's, it's a, capitalism is not perfect. It's not solving the problem. It's just making things better. And, and yeah, I, I think your analogy holds quite well, actually, now, now that I listen to it, even though I'm, I'm a little skittish on it. But I, I think it was well done. Okay. I, thanks for being open. Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth. What I, I really want to do is make sure I'm understanding. So the this sort of the notion of the priests, okay, is one that comes up and it, it strikes me maybe, Manuel, that, that you might have a model in your head of something like the Catholic Church when you're thinking about a religion. Uh, again, I don't want to speak for you, but I, I sort of I'm getting an impression of a, a Catholic Church or a Mormon Church or something like that with the outreach and the ties and the badges and what have you. Lovely people. So... What it makes me think of is, from my perspective, what was attractive about Christianity uh, was that there's an idea of the priesthood of all believers. So I'm quoting directly from the New Testament there, that everyone's a priest. Now, is that pie in the sky? Is that a kind of what on earth is that? It, it is a theological idea, but you have to go back to what the Jews were doing what the Israelites were doing uh, as you find it in the Old Testament. So the, the original temple, uh, 
tabernacle, I think it was called, was a tent in the desert, as far as I know. It wasn't this kind of stone thing that we see or the Al-Aqsa mosque or anything like that. But in the Jewish tradition, uh, the priest was going to think, going to an idea that Manuel brought up months ago was consecrated. So in the Jewish tent, in, in the center of the tent is the Holy of Holies. That is the dwelling place of God himself or itself, whatever you want to say. But because God by nature is holy, that is God cannot tolerate by God's nature any imperfection, any sin, to use the old word, or any, let's say, I don't know, wrongdoing, whatever. Can't tolerate it. That's just against the nature of God. So for the priest who was selected to be able to approach the Holy of Holies, this dwelling place of God, uh, you know, a priest had to be consecrated. His job, I think invariably it had to be a man. His job was to observe uh, different, you know, uh, rituals of cleaning, uh, sacrifice, because God had sort of outlined, look, uh, even though you're not perfect, you can approach me if you sacrifice the right way. I'm always reminded that one of the sacrifices that pleased God the most was burnt fat. And I thought, yeah, I agree with that. It, <laughs> it smells, it, it tastes great, but uh, not to trivialize. The, um, the point was that um, that model of a priest was, you know, hey, if you're going to be a priest, you're basically, you got one job. It's, it's highly demanding. You're actually going to be sacrificing normalcy and normal, you know, intercourse with the society. So your specialness has to do with making a, a personal sacrifice. And that's not a... Uh, an idea which is unknown to us. You look at great athletes like Michael Jordan and what make Michael Jordan great? Well, he sacrificed normalcy to become great. Or you look at Michael Jackson, the same thing. However, just to round out this point about priests per se, the theological point of Christianity is to say, well, the big acceptable perfect sacrifice is Jesus. Here is a person who purportedly lived his 33 years on the earth without ever committing a wrong, uh, but he was still a man. But he had the nature of God and he sacrificed that for us so that we could then become priests who enter into the presence of the holy God. Because God has got a sacrifice, which if we go through it, we're acceptable. Now, that's theological. I, I'm not trying to make a, an apology for Christianity. I'm not trying to evangelize by saying that. I'm simply trying to give a little bit of an outline about where that notion of priests came from. It's a Jewish thing. And where it, where it gets to in Christianity is supposedly, hey, you're a priest, I'm a priest, if we believe. Now, what you should be doing is saying, well, if I can approach this perfect thing, let's put it into the, the language of religion that's not a religion. If I get an insight or a, um, what would you call it, uh, uh, a um, sort of the unified experience that John talks about, a um, uh, higher state of consciousness and you Profound have... found experience or something? Yeah, yeah. Um, in any case, you know what I'm talking about. Some sort of profound experience, like you said, Mark. Um, you do walk out of that, and this is a matter of empirical fact, you walk out of that experience changed, and John uses the word, I think, onto-normativity. Onto being about reality and normativity being about what becomes normal. So the idea is if you have this um, special experience, he's got a name for it, but uh, unified consciousness experience, something like that, then you walk out, you're changed. And I think that was the idea of democratizing the priesthood through the Christian sacrifice. 
is that everyone has a means by which, has a language by which to um, commune with this. Um, I, I can't think of a right way to describe God without saying the word God. But the higher power. Higher power. The reality. Ineffable. Yeah, either way. The really real, the ineffable, ineffable et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if you'll indulge me, I'll just finish off with the history of the church super quickly where, okay, if the idea is the priesthood of all believers, why have we got, as Mark said correctly before, that guy and then there's all of us who like kind of like uh, docile sheep follow along, but there's that guy, right? And invariably it's a guy. Why is it like that if it's a priesthood of all believers? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'd like to reframe a couple of things that you said. Please. So the, the way I like to in, think about insights is, is it's a paradigm shift, right? So, so you're flipping some axioms in your relationship with the world. And then there's new rules and new rules afford new opportunities. And what if that path is not linear, right? Like what, what, what if you can have insights in one direction and like not have them here? And well, then it would be nice if we could democratize this, this priestliness because like Mark said, right? Like if, if one person excels here, like that doesn't say anything about what's going on here. And then we should praise the person for doing this, but not for doing this. And, and, and then, well, we can lift each other up, right? Like that, like that, that's what people do with skills, like, which are maybe also some sort of insight, but yeah. So, so like, I, I think, I think that's natural. And like, if, if you want to say, well, like, that's what, what being priest is like, well, like you, you get in touch with the divine in, in some sense, right. You, you, you get to experience this being closer with the union with God, then you, you need the ability and the authority to preach. So like, fair enough. Right. But then there's a couple issues, right? Like the fact that you're here participatorily doesn't mean that you have language to talk about or a framework in which to place the language. So that's a problem. And then secondly, well, depending on the need, right? Like if you have the person who does know it, like why, why do you need the person who kind of knows it, like you can wait a couple of years and th then, then we're there, right? But, but, but we also had this, this, this structure that we were talking about, right? like what well, that person can still talk to his peers and inform them. So, so um, what am I arguing? Well, maybe I'm, I'm arguing, arguing that there's a hierarchy in insights that you can climb and that is convergent to some degree and and that yeah well that we we can have recognition of that hierarchy but we can also respect the individual mm. yeah i like that i do want a point of clarification so the way i think uh, most of us have been using profound experience on the Discord server, uh, I proposed, because uh, uh, people were using the term transformative experience almost always in reference to taking psychedelics or something. Uh, and I sort of said, ah, that it, those people are often the same jerks they were before they took the drug, right? They may have, they may have thought they transformed, but actually what happened is they had a profound experience, they got nothing from it, didn't take anything back. And so just because you have the insight, just because you have the profound experience, doesn't mean that the transformation takes place. I think that's important. I, I believe Pastor Paul Vanderclay talks about this, right? You go to church, you hear the words, you're like, oh, pastor, that was great. And then two weeks later, you're like, never come back to this church. That guy's full of it, right? That happens like because we're people and we're just humaning all over the place. Um, that, that happens. And so the fact of the profound experience or, you know, and I think, 
I think I hate to do this to poor John. I think John equivocates on that, right? I think he's I think he's saying there is an experience that could be always transformative, and that's what I'm referring to. Like, that, I don't think that's pragmatically uh, a valid move, right? It's not pragmatically helpful because there's no reliable way to have that happen, right? There's only ways to help push it along, and maybe that's ritual. And look, to be fair, maybe that ritual part of that ritual is taking psychedelics. Like I'm, not, I'm not making a case against psychedelics uh, per se. Uh, I would very strongly make a case against personal exploration with psychedelics because I think the odds of that succeeding are almost zero. And when we had Tim Adlin on the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis uh, Discord YouTube channel, I talked to him about this, talked to several people about this, and he flat out agreed with me. Yeah, I know lots of people take drugs and it doesn't work. Like, like they're the same jerks they were before, right? Like this happens all the time. Most of the people who take drugs aren't transforming or aren't transforming for the better, or, you know, maybe are transforming, but not in a, in a way that's going to help them long-term, right? Or they have transformative, transformative experiences and they revert, uh, right? There's all sorts of things that can go wrong in that process. And so we kind of point to the abstraction and go, no, 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 no I meant this. Like, ah, but this isn't reliable, right? It's not reliable. So you can't use it pragmatically if it has zero reliability. And then we're very much relying on this idea of, of ritual to get us into that. All the things that are around, we'll say the core event, when we try to deconstruct and atomize things, sometimes we pull out the really important parts of them. This happens all the time in medicine. It happens all the time in economics. It happens all the time in religion, right? We're just trying to dig. Don't bother me with this church stuff and the Sunday and the Bible study and all this. I just want the thing, the little thing that I can have that will give me the transformative experience and, and then I'm done. I, I don't need the rest of it. But I don't think that's the way it works, right? The religio, I was just going to say. Yeah, well, yeah, religio is a whole long conversation, right? We could, we could go on in that forever, right? They want the essence of the religio, maybe. Like, what's the one, if I could get a religio pill, what would that look like? Because I'll take those all day. And granted, so would I. Uh, but I don't think that's a, a t attainable in some sense. And then a lot of what you were talking about, uh, Manuel, I think goes to, let me see if I can form my thoughts here. I think a lot of what you were talking about goes back to this idea of the overriding structures and how they interact. And you know, maybe maybe here on the last slide you'll 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 tie all this up in that way. But I I I suspect I suspect not. I suspect we have a lot more stuff to do, which is which is much more exciting to me because I'm really really enjoying this. But yeah, I think unless Jules has a follow up to my follow up. Uh... No, I, I'm sorry, but I've got a hard out in five minutes, so um, we may need to pick this up again. Um, we, we can do a tease for the last slide. Um, is that okay? Yeah. I'm sorry. So uh, I was going into the individual practices. Um, so um, I gave a couple of categories. Uh, imagination, which is relating to relation, I guess. <laughs> you're, you're, you're having the ability to relate inside of yourself. Uh, without having to participate in the world, which is a valuable skill. This is what Peterson talks about. You can make a model of yourself that dies instead of that you have to go out and die yourself. Then aspiration is the thing that allows us to aim in a specific direction uh, with our lives. A perspective is a thing from which you relate to things. Um, so having a practice or several practices probably where you do things like circumambulation, where you gain multiple perspectives on a thing, but you can also take one perspective and start looking at multiple things. So, so that, that, there's different ways of, of playing with that, but like we, we, we're using the word fluidity with perspective. Right, like you, you need to get fluid with, with with how you adopt perspectives, and and that's 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 necessary to have right understanding. And then attention, right? So, like, how how do we 
how do we get good at a thing? Well, like we attend to it, we spend a lot of time and and focus on it, and and th that is that is a quality of relationship, I guess, uh, that we need to train because uh, if if you don't have proper attention, you're never going to learn anything. Maybe um, that's what creates relationship, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Like it, it, it's, it's, it holds the, the relationship. Right. And, and then the focus, the focus is the thing inside the attention where you're, you're, I'm attending to the screen and then I'm going to your face and then go to that phase and then I'm floating off and, and my focus is, isn't focused. <laughs> so yeah, uh, that, that, those, those two, well, we have, we have our model and we think they they have this strange relationship with each other. Um, which is ineffable in some sense, <laughs> and and then uh, yeah, the the last thing that came up for me was understanding. It's really important to to relate to the world from an understanding. Like like we were talking about this, that it gives you a sense of security if if you understand things, because then you're not in chaos, and uh, it, it it allows you a way to relate that that is reliable and and it can extend outside of 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 your current relationship with the world right like so it's it it allows this a way to engage with the fractal like nature of 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 being so yeah that that's kind of what the individual uh, ecology would be uh, dancing around and also not complete list again yeah. yeah i like that that's uh that's great i like what you've done with the uh with the models and how you've played with with that i've yeah this is a really nice slide and i think you're right it's a good teaser and uh you know i, I there's a lot of possibility there and i, I like in some sense we're, we're sort of bumping up against the church structure and the protestantism right when we when we talk about this stuff, we're, we're sort of bumping up against that very personal relationship and that very global goal, right? So personal relationship, global goal, stuff in the middle, ah, what do we do, right? And then there's maybe there's some way we can engender opponent processing. Maybe that's where we sort of pick it up from individual practices and, and see where, we're, where we want to go in the next conversation. But I think it'd be good to do a next conversation. And uh, Jules, since you have to go, why don't you, uh, why don't you close this out? Thank you. Well, um, Mark, Emmanuel, that, that, that was really great. I personally really appreciate um, the effort that you put into the, with the, the presentation. And um, it's, it's really obvious that you, you, you think in, in terms of these fundamental categories. So you're obviously a builder. At least that's the way I am, you know, receiving what you're laying out here. And um, well, time is, I'm not sure what you said earlier, Mark, but, you know, time destroys all things. It's a pity we can't keep going right now. Um, but I like what you're setting up. And, um, yeah, I, I would look forward to doing another one, Mark, and maybe you could lead that one since we've all had a go. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll have to try and uh, follow in your footsteps here. It's, these are big shoes to fill. You guys did such good jobs with these slideshows, so. I really appreciate these slides, Manuel. You put uh, an amazing amount of thought and time into this and, and really nailed it, in, in my opinion. But uh, please, Jules, go on. Oh, no, absolutely. I think you're uh, more than up to the task, man. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the recording, and I, I'm really sorry. I have to get to this other meeting. So um, let me press stop.